Hello, and welcome to The Two View, the cutting-edge educational show for PAs and nurse practitioners in emergency medicine and urgent care. My name is Mike Sharma. I'm a practicing emergency medicine and urgent care PA in Dallas, Texas, and an adjunct professor of PA studies. And I'm Martha Roberts. Hi, Mike. I'm an emergency medicine NP and assistant professor in Northern California. And as of last week, I am now certified by a judge to be an expert witness. Wow. Well, congratulations on being certified. Okay. Better than being certifiable, I suppose. <laughs> you just also got back from Las Vegas after the completion of the second running of the Center of Medical Education's Mastering Pediatric Emergencies Conference. Was it just as good the second time around? Yes. PEDS 2.0 is fabulous. I would definitely do it again. In fact, I'm already looking forward to September 2025, where I will be back there doing the same, but better. Every time it gets better. I really enjoy the variety of speakers on this panel. Some new people, not usually at our other courses because they were all PEDS specialists. And Dr. Emily Rose did a wonderful job. Love her textbook, by the way. Um, organized this very well. Special thanks to the whole team. Dave, Great job there as well, and um, the rest of our audio crew. So thank you. I had like five minutes of overlap with Emily as I was leaving from my um, EKG interpretation. She was coming in for imaging interpretation, and like I just just uh, five minutes, I was like, this person seems like a cool person, and so I'm really yeah. um, excited to be there. We're all gonna be there in December together. We're all lecturing the same day, so that'll be cool to hang with her more. And uh, we'll talk more about how people can get the material from Pete's Toy Point as you said, in a little bit. Uh, you're just getting home. I'm heading out, okay, for the first time I'm getting to visit my uh, big girl, Geeka, at college for her school's family weekend. She's got a big part in a choir concert. We're going to go to a football game. I'm super excited to re-experience college campus life. I wonder what it's going to be like on this side of 40, because I loved all that stuff on that side of 25. I was even a tour guide when I was back at Texas A&M doing the whole, like, maroon polo, khaki shorts, walking backwards, telling terrible jokes. I guess some things aren't any different than today, honestly. But anyways, those are the good old days, right? What are your uh, favorite memories from college, Martha? You were up in the D.C. area, right? Yes, I was actually a librarian for four years. It was really cool. I learned a lot, a lot about reading and organizing and books. It was a wonderful experience. But I wasn't in the library the entire time. It was probably – those years were really the best years of my life, um, honestly. I, I have fun now, don't get me wrong, but – I will never forget my days at American University in Georgetown. Washington, D.C. in general is really a favorite memory of mine. I lived there for almost 20 years. I really do miss it a lot. As an aside, my father's first degree was in library science, of all things. So like my dad back in the day spent a lot of time in the library. And uh, but, but relative to the D.C. thing, we figured out that we both were living in the D.C. area at the very same time, like 20 years ago. Like It's pretty crazy. Uh, that's where I met my wife. Fast forward to now, we just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. So, oh, love you, honey. Ha happy anniversary. <laughs> well, it is time for our first segment, The Wet Read, where Martha and I get 60 quick seconds or so to talk about something that caught our eye. Yes. Okay. So, we're going to talk first about water beads, all right? And I feel like today's kids have survived the Tide Pod era, but now there's a new hazard in uh, everybody's home, it seems, with... Uh, to contend with. These tiny little colorful beads are the size of a pinhead in their dehydrated form and are made from a chemical that is super absorbent to water. Once exposed to water, they balloon up to about 100 times their size and they're commonly found in toys, florist decorations, agricultural products, etc. Because they're so small, they can spill and go everywhere. And because they're so brightly colored, kids will be attracted to them and they'll swallow them or put them in their nose or their ears. These are all moist environments, as we would remember from basic physical exam, right? And uh, hmm, they're going to grow. So an October 2024 article uh, in the Annals of Emergency Medicine suggests these are responsible for thousands of ED visits between 2018 and 2022. That must have been a fun one to work on. And the number <laughs> of visits spiked over 100% between 2021 and 22. Ingestion is most common as the method of injury, but GI symptoms that uh, ca that cause side effects, they can be kind of nonspecific. And to make things even harder, they really are difficult to find on CT and ultrasound because they're radiolucent. Yeah, I've seen these before. They're marketed as Orbeez, O-R-B-E-E-Z with a Z among other brand names. 
I watched a video. Like, it's funny you mentioned, like, kids are attracted to them. One use is it, it attracts chicks, like baby chicks, to their feed. And it's like, are the chicks eating these weird chemicals too? And what does that mean if we eat the – anyways. Uh, well, understandably, it's the under five-year-olds that are at high risk with these things, whether you are a baby chick or a baby human. And like most other ingestions or insertions into orifices, uh, you know, like anything else we see, it's usually the under five crowd that's putting things into places they shouldn't be putting things into. We have that article from Annals as well as a warning page from the U.S. Consumer Products Safety Commission – with lots of great pictures, not only of these beads, but also the KUB x-ray of what looks like a child that swallowed, must be hundreds of these things. It looks pretty gnarly. Uh, links to these things and everything we talk about in every episode are on our website, twoview.fireside.fm. That's the number, twoview.fireside.fm. Mike, also a fun little tidbit from UC Davis PEDS surgical team, breaking this down a little bit more for us. So basically, a child could swallow a water bead, and it can expand in their throat, their intestines. It causes the blockage. Several beads at once can cause and have caused bowel obstruction, resulting in multiple surgeries and lengthy hospital stays, not to mention, quote from their surgical team, we urge the public not to buy these. So also, Mike, Poison Control says they do want calls on this one, so give them a call at 1-800-222-1222. Just make sure you dial 800-222-1222, 888-222-1222 is a radically different number. Don't ask me how I know. Uh. Well, if you thought dehydrated water beads were small, how about bacteria? JAMA published an article in August 2024 about the rise of carbapenem-resistant, hypervirulent Klebsiella pneumonia, or CRHVKP, if you're nasty. We've all answered test questions about Klebsiella pneumonia before. You know, patients with alcohol use disorder or other immunocompromising conditions are at risk for Klebsiella infections. Pneumonia from Klebsiella can lead to this bright red Current jelly sputum, mm -mm, current jelly, delicious. Garden variety club seal is also one of the top causes of gram negative bacteremia as well. The difference with CRHVKP is that it's hypervirulent, that's the HV, it doesn't need an immunocompromised host and can be spread among healthy people in the community. The most serious consequence of this infection is a hepatic abscess without other biliary tract disease going on. Kind of a weird thing to have like an isolated hepatic abscess. It can also cause, cause endophthalmitis in the eyes, necrotizing fasciitis, meningitis, and of course pneumonia. Be on the lookout for these conditions and consider, could your patient be suffering from this hypervirulent Klebsiella pneumonia bacteria, especially if, you know, you try a couple things or failing to improve or standard treatment. Mortality rates from invasive infection from Klebsiella pneumonia, the hypervirulent type, can get as high as 31%. Ugh. All right. These are tough infections to suspect clinically before some tests are run. So here are two things you can do to increase your odds. All right. So number one, a quick, easy question to ask any patient with suspected infection is, is there anyone around you that is sick with anything in particular or in the hospital? And number two, Mike, something you mentioned in your eye emergencies talk before is to be suspicious of eye problems that don't turn around quickly with what you think is the correct treatment or eye problems that don't fit neatly into a known disease process that you're familiar with. These are people that ophthalmology needs to know about. Arrange close follow-up, maybe even transfer them to the hospital that has ophthalmology, depending on your level of concern and their ability to follow up. Yeah, that's right. You know, working at an academic emergency department these past few years and being able to consult ophthalmologists in-house has, you know, really been eye-opening. Get it? Get it? <laughs> ah, about how many uh, weird eye conditions are out there. I am super excited to talk about eye stuff at our upcoming Original Emergency Medicine Boot Camp in Las Vegas coming up in December, like I mentioned. And I also can't wait to give you a big old hug. Can you believe it's been a year since I've seen you in person? Like, that's that's never happened before, literally since 2019. We've never spent this much time apart, I don't think, physically. I know. Honestly, I haven't quite been myself. I have been overworking. It's kind of like... Hmm. Uh, you know, we go through these periods, especially when we work in the hospital, where we take on a lot of work at one time, and then maybe we take a long time off. And not that I took too much time off, but I'm back to old Martha, where it's just like nonstop, go to all the times, like handling four and five jobs, flying here, flying there. And I, 
I've, the amount of time I've spent in Las Vegas, I feel like I should get a retirement home in Henderson. But um, hey, you know, my ultimate dream is to one day uh, be a poker dealer just for fun, just for fun, you know? It's funny you mentioned that, right? So as an aside, briefly, when you're in the military, you get this GI Bill, right? So you can like, you get to spend money towards education and sure, I can spend it on a doctorate or there is an option to spend it on being a, a car dealer. That's a school <laughs> I could go to and have it paid for by my service in the military. I, I sincerely thought about it, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Maybe a doctorate uh, is more useful. Hard to tell, honestly. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, even if you've seen a clip here and there of the boot camp lectures, one thing that is new and exciting every single year we do a boot camp is interacting with you, folks who are attending the boot camp. Yeah, I totally agree, Mike. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about our courses because if you're listening to this podcast, you know that. We put on good shows, right? But if you haven't been to one, you're just like, eh, you know, I, too, I listen to these two jokers sometimes and try to determine if I want to come hang out. It's really a great time. Honestly, our 40th episode is coming up of The Two View, so we're going to do something really special for that and give away a whole course. It's going, to be, it's going to be the best you've ever seen. And also, this particular winter, we are going to be back in Las Vegas in December, we have procedures, ultrasound. I like to go this because I get a refresher on real live bodies. And then the main course, it's around the holidays on the Vegas Strip. Lots to do and see beyond the course. It's worth your time. I still uh, would say leave the neonates, the newborns, and the toddlers at home. There's really nothing for these kids to do in Vegas. Um, if I see one more baby, honestly. I think Vegas is good for families in the summer because there's a lot of water stuff. But yeah, in the in the winter, it's more of like ooh and ah at the sites, more of an adult thing, really. Well, um, you know, these panels are great to you've got people who are doing what you do in the trenches with you, and they just love talking to you about emergency medicine and urgent care. You can ask questions during the talks on your mobile device. You'll get real-time answers from us during the talks. You can catch us in between talks and talk to us face-to-face. -face. And we also do these panel discussions where we all get up on stage and we kind of debate some of the deeper questions and hotter topics. It's so great to see, like, these are reasonable people who are experienced to have seen a thing or two, and yet we still disagree on some of these things. Okay, so it's kind of really interesting about how the the what acceptable practice is and how there is a nice variety. Yeah, honestly, some of these people I grew up listening to and still love to listen to. Diane Bernbaumer, we got Kevin Clower, we got Jan Schoenberger, we've got um, who else is someone else I love? Michael to Gooch, we got Chip Gooch, Lang. we got Ken Mill, we got Chip Lang. I mean, these are all people that. Really, I would pay to see. I would. Ramin, and I do. Is Ramin uh, Tabatabai coming back as well, I think? You know, I'm not sure. Um, and actually, I'm not 100% sure about Kevin, but the lineup is going to be good no matter what. Exactly right. Well, that's going to be uh, 4th through 7th of December at Historic Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. That's the main course. Uh, your pre-conference days, there's ultrasound workshops December 2nd, or third, you kind of pick one or the other, procedures workshop on the third, and then pharmacology workshop on the third as well. So go ahead and like start putting in your requests now. Okay, I was just asked by my boss, hey, give me your December uh, vacation dates. And so I'm definitely going to have to put in to make sure I get to spend a little bit extra time in Las Vegas here. We have this special link that we're not sharing anywhere else. It's for friends of the podcast. It's one of those bit.ly, like, like those shortened links. Okay, so listen up real quick. Bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash E-M-B-C dash Las dash Vegas. It's a mouthful. I'm going to do it one more time. B-I-T dot L-Y slash E-M-B-C dash Las Dash Vegas. It'll be on the show notes, right? Twoview.fireside.fm. That'll identify you as being part of the Two View tribe. We can hang out. We can throw some dice. It's whatever, you know. Like I'm not gonna, you know, force you anything untoward. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But we'll have some fun, okay? So take a look at the show notes here. All right. So let's get on to our segment two, the dry scan. Our next segment where we penetrate a little bit deeper into two other topics. So this first one uh, we want to kind of throw out there at you, is non-adherence, doxycycline's weakness for the treatment of STI. This just like sounds terrible, honestly. But uh, 
Let's try to make it less scary. Fans of the Two View podcast and fans of Chlamydia, uh, thanks, Mike. I mean, is this SNL's weekend update? You know, sometimes Mike puts <laughs> these notes in here and I have to read it. So, yeah, fans of Chlamydia, I see you putting in those liner notes. Anyways, you all remember back in 2021 when the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, released new guidelines on the treatment of S. TIs. We covered those guidelines way back on episode nine. One of the most impactful changes of those guidelines on our practice in the emergency department in urgent care was the new treatment recommendation for chlamydia. It used to be that when patients came in, either with a positive test for chlamydia or a known exposure to the disease, or maybe just some symptoms that might be attributable to chlamydia, they get a big slug of azithromycin, one gram orally, right there in front of you, and that was that. And then they were treated for uncomplicated uh, tr- uh, chlamydia, no need to go to the pharmacy. You know, if you had to pin me down, I'd solidly be in the anti-chlamydia camp, okay? yeah. not pro-chlamydia. I'm, I'm right. not neutral. Okay. Back in my military days, I used to call this a shot in a shot. For whatever reason, our clinic ordered the azithromycin powder that you would like sprinkle to some water. And so my soldiers would get an IM injection of ceftriaxone and a quick drink of azithromycin. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, keep those soldiers clean. Well, because of concerns about rising resistance rates against azithromycin in 2021, the CDC started recommending that we do a week of doxycycline as the first-line treatment for non-pregnant patients with uncomplicated chlamydia. And prompt treatment is important. Delays in treatment can result in acute complications like pelvic inflammatory disease, and that can lead to lifelong problems like increased risks of ectopic pregnancy and infertility. So a study of 144 patients in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine found that 18% of patients, basically one in five, failed to pick up electronic prescriptions for doxycycline sent you know, from the ED. Understandably, 23% of those non-adherent patients showed back up to see us in the ED with the same chief complaint that brought them there in the first place. Uh, We're not going to call that malingering. We will discuss what malingering is at the end of this podcast, though. That's just non-compliance, people. So the authors state that no differences were detected in baseline demographics, housing status, insurance type, sexual orientation, or STI history. This is a problem, and I don't know if there's an easy solution. In some EDs that have hospital-based pharmacies, it may be possible to have the prescription bottle actually sent to the ED so it can be handed to the patient. Indeed, this is a recommendation from the CDC in their 2021 guidelines. Quote, among persons receiving multi-dose regimens, medication should be dispensed with all doses involved on-site and in the clinic, and the first dose should be directly observed some dot therapy for chlamydia. But I don't know how realistic this is for every emergency department and urgent care clinic. I can tell you legally, though, if they suggest it and they say it, by gosh, you should be trying to do it and write down reasons why you didn't. The CDC offers another suggestion, quoting again, to, quote, maximize adherence with recommended therapies on site, directly observed single-dose therapy with azithromycin should always be available for persons whom adherence with multidosing is going to be considerable concern. This is really tough. Uh, You know, in certain situations where adherence is really important, like if someone has a legit, like, diagnosis or a clear exposure, uh, I I like to have a follow-on talk with patients. Like, is there anything keeping you from picking up this prescription from the pharmacy? And then just thinking through the problem with them, if they say, yeah, there is a problem. I just checked my favorite prescription saver card. Um, it rhymes or it sounds like a uh, ud, ud, gay, rex. No, <laughs> I'm trying to do the pig Latin. It's not working out. Anyways, whatever. But you get the idea. It's a prescription saving card. I'm not trying to like name a certain one. But anyways, a week <laughs> of doxy will run you anywhere from $3.00. To $27, depending on where you go to pick it up. And a lot of folks don't have 27 bucks burning a hole in their pocket, you know. Whether it's a plan to follow up with a specialist or a plan to pick up medication, these these are shared problems for us to solve. The patients and ours problem together. Devising a follow-up plan that makes sense for the patient based on their individual needs. Like, you know, if you tell someone like, yeah, you got to follow up with a pediatric neurologist, uh, you know, go there tomorrow to an uninsured patient or a patient who works the next day. Like some of these things aren't based in reality. You have to have a plan that's based in reality. And sometimes it's a struggle to do with people who have, you know, significant social determinants of health that are getting in the way. But but what also blew me away, Martha, is that statement from the authors of the study this is not an insurance issue. 
This is not a male-female issue. This is not a demographics issue. This is like across the board, one in five patients. And that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. And that's just with picking up the prescription. Then you've got to tolerate doxycycline for a week. That's a whole other study to be done, honestly. Yeah, well, I mean, add it to my list of studies that need to be done. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Well, speaking of medication needs, what does a patient need when they tell us that they have an allergy to penicillin or a cephalosporin? You know, one of those beta-lactam antibiotics. Could it be that what they actually need is a beta-lactam antibiotic? Beta-lactams are the first-line treatment for some of the most common infections in our patients, like pneumonias, UTIs, intra-abdominal infections, and syphilis, because of their general safety, effectiveness, and low adverse reaction rates. However, we know that allergies to penicillin are the most commonly documented drug class allergies. Not only does that give us pause when considering giving a penicillin or a cephalosporin, some of us were taught about a cross reactivity in some patients who are allergic to both penicillins and cephalosporins. Okay, hopefully, what will set your mind at ease is a retrospective observational study published in Academic Emergency Medicine in August of this year. It documented what happened when an ED gave a full-dose challenge of a beta-lactam antibiotic in 184 emergency department patients with documented beta-lactam allergies between 2021 and 2022. Specifically, these are patients that had marked a moderate, severe, or unknown severity beta-lactam allergy without a documentation of previously tolerating the drug. Yeah, Mike, you know, I was just taking a look at Ken Milne's Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine that I believe covered this article in August of 2024. I'm sorry if you were going to mention that a little bit later. But yeah, this is this is absolutely fascinating stuff. Bottom line, the number of patients that suffered an anaphylactic reaction was a nice round number of, do you want to say it? Zero. Zero. No anaphylactic reactions in these patients. Less than 3% went on to have any reactions that could be considered an allergic reaction at all, and those were limited to rash or itching. This is fantastic news and further proof that we shouldn't just take a penicillin allergy in the EMR at face value. I like asking my patients, like, hey, this says you have a penicillin allergy. Can you tell me more about that? You might be very surprised about the answer. Sometimes the answer is, well, my parents said I got amoxicillin as a kid and I had a rash. We all know that could be for a lot of reasons. Sometimes the, you know, febrile illness as a child causes a rash, but it's chalked up to like, ah, just say you have an allergy and, and, and that's that, right? Or they describe a more of an intolerance uh Picture like, oh yeah, I took amoxicillin and I had the runs for a couple of days or some nausea. Like that's not an allergic reaction. That's kind of a class effect of any antibiotic, honestly, or even worse. One of my parents said they have a penicillin allergy and they say they told me to say I had one too, just in case. A, a previous study suggests that up to 90% of patients with documented penicillin allergies fail to have an allergic reaction with a penicillin skin test. In addition, up to 80% of patients who had penicillin sensitivity may lose that sensitivity within 10 years time. In fact, some people with a listed penicillin allergy will tell me, oh yeah, I had like amoxicillin a year or two ago and it was fine. All that being said, the study authors do acknowledge that there is a non-zero chance of serious allergic reaction occurring with a direct allergy challenge. With all the variables involved, if you're interested in challenging somebody with a documented beta-lactam allergy by giving them a beta-lactam, um, we don't really have time on this podcast to, to go through all the, the finer points here. Work with a senior colleague or collaborating physician on site and go over the situation with them and you guys talk it out. Should I direct challenge this person or should I pass on that? Yeah, so... <clears throat> If you want to take a look at uh, Ken covering this in a little bit more detail, it's episode number 452. It's called I'm Still Standing After the Allergy Challenge. So we'll put that in the liner notes for you to take a look at. And he, you can either read it or you can listen to him. It's really great. He records his whole uh, show and it's really great. So if you haven't been uh, listening to the SGEM, I highly suggest that you get on it. Okay. All right. We also have a lot of resources in our show to help you make that decision. And those will all be on our website, twoview.fireside.fm. 
And we've got a brief guide from the University of Nebraska Medical Center with an overview of the topic, including more information on potential antibiotic selection. So more details, check it out when you get a chance. Yeah, Ken, as he often does, actually has the, I think, main author of the study on. So really talking just directly from the source, which is awesome. Lastly, it's our oral contrast segment where we get into all the nooks and crannies of a topic. And uh, I sent this to you, Martha, and right away we, we talked about how we differ in our approach to this topic. And I was like, this is a perfect thing for us to talk about. I sent you this quiz from Medscape that talked about the M word malingering. Yeah, I'm not afraid of it. I ain't afraid of you, malingering. I'll tell you. Honestly, don't be afraid. Uh, for our final segment today, I want to talk about patients who come to the ER every day and whether or not these patients can be given the diagnosis of malingering. And and just to spoil it, right, I don't think I've ever diag diagnosed somebody with malingering. Um, I have not used the word in my chart ever. Uh, I... I you know, we'll talk about kind of why that might be over the course of the next few minutes here, but that's kind of my personal position. Well, hopefully I can convince you and many other people that it is a safe thing to do. And there are some times when you don't, but let's get down to it. So there are several resources online that are useful for clinicians in regard to actually diagnosing the patient with malingering. I know that ASEP has some guidelines as well as Medscape and some other news articles and legal journals, but I want to start off by talking about what the National Library of Medicine or NIH has to say. They break down basically a continuing education activity reviewing what malingering actually is. So malingering can be defined as a falsification or profound exaggeration of illness, and this can be either physical or mental, to gain external benefits, such as, I'm going to list a few, avoiding work or responsibility, seeking drugs, avoiding trial, seeking attention, avoiding military services, leave from school, paid leave from a job, among many other things. It's not a psychiatric illness per se, according to the DSM-5, but it's noted by several groups of psychiatrists as a potential to be. So it gets a little messy there. Oftentimes, malingerers show poor compliance with treatment and stop complaining about the assumed illness only after gaining the external benefit. Sometimes they'll be kind and considerate and then quickly become rude and agitated when they are not getting the results in which they came in for. This is different than factitious disorder, which is the new name for Munchausen syndrome. Factitious disorder, these people are uh, actually harming themselves or faking symptoms, and the goal there is just to obtain the medical treatment, the, to be in the patient role. They're not seeking um, a secondary gain. They're purely seeking to be the patient. But this is different. Malingering is different. These folks want something else beyond the care. Per the NIH, malingering has no specific etiology. As you can see, the, the secondary gain desired can be very broad, but the causes include socioeconomic conditions. It's reported often uh, among you know people trying to avoid trial, as you mentioned, students wanting to avoid school, workers wanting to avoid work, uh, people with housing instability looking for you know those sweet, sweet turkey sandwiches or just a, a, a place out of, off the street for the night or, or longer. Patients who abuse recreational drugs or have use disorder, they'll exaggerate their symptoms or pain or even things like insomnia to receive some of those drugs of abuse that they're looking for. And, I, you know, I feel like you take anything uh, too much or for long enough, it can be a drug of abuse. You know, like even the humble gabapentin now is becoming a drug of abuse. That's one of the ones that I've started to kind of like, yeah, you know, you've been off your gabapentin for a week or two. Let's just have you go ahead and follow up with a family doctor. There's not really an emergent need to refill you know, your gabapentin today. Mike, so sometimes, you know, with the gabapentin, that's an interesting one, but I feel like I'm going to start bullying people for compazine. Give me my compazine. <laughs> Love like, that are drug. Are you looking for like PO compazine to go home with or are you just yes. want like, a shot? Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. it's it's prescribed to me for migraines and it's such a wonderful drug, but anyway. That's what I figured. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm more of an ondansetron junkie myself. Like I would <laughs> just love having some ondansetron in, in the, the medicine cabinet, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, th what makes it even harder is that malingering has close associations with some DSM-5 conditions like antisocial personality disorder and histrionic personality traits. You may look back in the patient's chart and you might see that this patient has been seen multiple times, maybe even by you or your colleagues that day 
or the day before or at other EDs, things like that. Yeah. So, you know, they're getting external or secondary gain in some way. They might fake the illness. It could be physical, psychological, et cetera. Um, But what they're doing is consciously lying about their condition to get a benefit. And upon achieving that benefit, really, they stop complaining. And no medicine or intervention can really cure malingerer, blah, blah, blah. No medicine or intervention can cure malingerers. Upon detailed history, the malingerer may exhaust their excuses and just frankly give up. I'm I'm not convinced that you're going to convince me, but I will. I'm open to it. I'm open to listening to what you have to say here. So so I want to hear how, how why should I be comfortable using this diagnosis? So the DSM five, although does not necessarily make this a diagnosis, says that these four complaints, if they're present, could be considered malingering. We should consider them, right? So number one, the medical legal context of the presentation, for example, a lawyer sending his client for evaluation or patient presents with an illness while facing facing trial. Two, a marked discrepancy between the individual's claimed stress or disability, and objective finding and observation. Three, lack of compliance with diagnostic evaluation, whether those be in the past or current, and treatment regimen and follow-up care. And number four, presence of antisocial personality disorder. See how they kind of cross over here. Well, whatever you choose to do, it's really – I mean, like, this is kind of a, like, no doy, but, like, a careful and detailed history taking is necessary to rule out malingering or – to rule out or in any other condition, honestly. But, you know, what you're looking for here in particular is a couple of things, right? So um, watch for discrepancies in a person's behavior while taking a prolonged detailed history. So, so something I like to, to do sometimes is like someone just talks about like the crippling shoulder pain, they can't move their shoulder. And I'll just kind of like be chatting them up, chatting them up and be like, hey, uh, do you mind like take your shirt off real quick so I can take a look at your shoulder? And like, whoop, like off comes a shirt, like both arms go up very easily. And then right after that, they're like, oh, oh, my shoulder. So like right away, it's like, wow, like the shoulder moved quite well just a second ago. You want to dig deeper if you have the time and opportunity into any sort of personality traits or disorders like uh, antisocial, like histrionic. Maybe you you ask about what's going on with uh, any sort of legal status here. You know, they may talk about like, yeah, I was in, I was injured at the job, and you know, like they're you know I'm suing them, and like it's a whole thing, and, and so like that could be a key right there. Potentially, it's like, oh, like you're interested in like getting something out of somebody else, and that's part of your care. It's interesting. I don't think it's a lock, but it's interesting. Sometimes you can like ask. Almost like, and, and this is where I get kind of oogie, right? Because it's like, you know, a, a suggestion by some sources is ask rapid questions and observe the incoherence between answers. We all know that sometimes you can have a patient that comes through the ER and they'll tell the triage nurse, the screening PA, you as a treating PA or NP, and then the attending, all slightly different varieties of the same story. And that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with malingering. It's just because patients remember things differently or whatever. So it's like the, the incoherence is kind of a toss up for me. But but it's but it, I can see how that would be concerning if you're asking if you personally are asking the same question and you get multiple different answers in one encounter. That's kind of weird. You want to mix up kind of like open-ended and leading questions like, you know, questioning about symptoms not related to this illness may also induce a positive answer. Um, The patient not knowing much about the thing they're trying to get labeled as may say yes to any question. So I'll I'll do this sometimes like not to try to catch a kid in a lie, but it's like some kid is like, oh, like my throat hurts and my chest hurts and my belly hurts. And I'm like, does your hair hurt? hurt and Mm -hmm. they'll go yeah yeah my hair hurts it's like oh wow like what if i wiggle your big toe back and forth oh it hurts so like okay very interesting right i'll I'll kind of like flash a look to the parents and they'll kind of like smile look back at me so there's there's certain things where it's like oh you know what a big part of this disease is hair hurting is your hair hurting you and if they say yeah it's like that's interesting okay and then you want to watch for any sort of exaggeration of psychiatric symptoms like hallucinations or things like that um that that's a lot, frankly, and and I don't know, I don't know how much time I have, and an interest that I have, frankly, in in really 
delving into all these things, but I can see how they'd be <laughs> helpful in in building a story, so to speak. Yeah, I can tell you're not interested. It's fine, but <laughs> no, I'm well, only I kidding. Just, I mean, it, I'm, I'm interested because like I'm the one that suggested this topic, but I just um, it's a lot. I just worry I get it. about it. I, I know I'm just worried about what happens because I think we'll talk about like it's almost like diagnosing somebody with asthma. Hmm. They are forever an asthmatic, um, and, and that can affect a lot of things, right? Sure, sure. Now they can't serve in the military. Now they can't what like so many things. So like you put that. I mean, we'll talk about it later on. I guess yeah. what happens when you put malingering in a chart, but uh, yeah. I'm gonna, so what, I'm gonna break it all down. I am, and okay. I'm gonna give you a patient case, a real case that I deal with, and and why it won't follow them forever. So okay. It's just case by case basis. So it's very important, though, that the patient receives a pretty solid mental status exam, including comments in your chart regarding the appearance and behavior. It's completely appropriate to note that the patient may be disheveled, untidy, or not making eye contact. You absolutely want to document irritation or hostile behavior. Avoid derogatory terms that are judgmental and stick to the objective findings. So comment on the patient's mood, whether they have a low or elevated mood, or comment on thoughts of whether they've exaggerated, they're delusional or bizarre. Perception, insight, and cognition are also important to consider, including whether or not they have good insight about their disease or understanding. If the cognition is inappropriate, this may be because they're not compliant and they might be lying. Consider doing multiple examinations, going back and talking to the patient multiple times, hearing them second, uh, third visit, you know, comparing these, looking at charts. Um, But really, I don't read anybody's chart until after I do my full examination. So I don't form a bias. Really? That's really important. Yeah, I really don't. I don't need to. Unless it's like the patient is there for like, you know, a prolonged cancer treatment and this is a known patient that we do a certain thing. I don't want them to think I'm incompetent. But I don't like to form a bias against a patient. I want to treat everybody the same. And I only want helpful information to why they're there today. But that's a whole nother side note. We've talked about this before. Absolutely note their history of hospitalizations and number of visits After you talk to them, we'll talk about this in a minute. They are important. They are relative. And then any medications, whether or not they're compliant, family history, social history, other social supports, and comment about whether or not they're homeless because it's a value of you. It's a value to you about whether you want to actually integrate social work instead of like medicines or medications or treatments. You know, this is going to help them solve their issue, not necessarily uh, a medical complaint. This is a social, I have a housing issue. You hear my skepticism, but with regards to everything you just said, I own 100% agree with everything you just said. And this is something that I, despite everything else I may do or not do that's different from what you do in terms of diagnosing with malingering, I do everything you just said there. So like full agreement with that one. Now that was history. What about evaluation, right? If they were already seen early in the day or the day before and they had normal blood work, imaging, exam... And, you know, when they kind of say like, well, there's no new trauma or I feel the same or maybe I have even better, it's not, you know, totally beyond the pale to say and document, hey, we have recent prior blood work, we have recent imaging, your clinical presentation is stable and you can kind of comment on that in the chart as well as to the patient. And and you want to document that I reviewed all those things. You know, not only is that good for patient care, um, you know, it kind of is kind of a signpost to future people who will treat care this patient or view your chart, okay? But also it speaks to the complexity of this patient, and that has other implications in terms of your MDM. You consider offering alternative pain treatments like I'll find an NSAID that this person has not had yet. I promise you. There's like a dozen <laughs> NSAIDs. I'll find one, okay? I promise you. Um, you know, or you could switch classes slightly. Like, okay, well, you've had ibuprofen. Let's go with acetaminophen or something like that, right? Uh, or there's also like there's lidocaine. There's um, topical uh, salicylate, with, uh, aka like you know like your 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 Bengay or icy hot patches. You've got capsaicin. There's so many different kinds of pain treatments. If the patient was referred to orthopedics for a hand injury that was clean for acute bony pathology on fractures, you may want to consider other non-pharmacological treatments, right? Like you want to do a, an ACE wrap or a splint. I'm a big fan of the TENS unit. Okay, this electro stem, you can get that over the counter. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't 
if you're interested in using the malingering diagnosis, you can still do that even with you still treating the patient with an appropriate treatment. Yeah. And just one side note, Mike, like two, actually two side notes. Number one, right. if you are doing something that was missed on the prior exam, eh, could be application of a splint really be considered malingering, right? You know, maybe not. Maybe they just got incomplete care and you're trying to basically add to whatever wasn't done earlier. And that's definitely something. And you could do medical screening exam as part of your diagnosis or, um, you know, the, the diagnosis of pain certainly is a diagnosis. But even more so, just to play devil's advocate, don't allow any bias. Like when a nurse says, hey, uh, we'll use my fake patient, well, fake patient name, Sam, that I'm going to talk about later. Sam is back. He's here. Can you just quickly discharge him? Don't get sucked into that trap either, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't care, honestly, about what the nurse's opinion is of this patient when it comes to, can you just see them quickly and leave? Like, of course, I'm, I'm going to take their input into consideration, but I'm not going to do anything without seeing the patient and reevaluating them. No, I'm not going to just put the discharge up just because you say he's back again. No, thank you. I think that that's a trap. And I have certainly seen patients that I would want to put for the diagnosis of malingering, but then they say, I didn't want to tell that nurse because I know she hates me. She sees me every day, but today I have blood in my stool and it's really there. You know, so these are all things that you just need to be careful about. I just want to make it clear that I would never say I don't care what the nurses think. Okay, I know listen, some I'm a nurse. To me that I work with. Look, I'm <laughs> you, not saying you can say that you're a nurse, I, but I would never say that. I take, I, I, I take it back. Not just to mess around. I misspoke. But I, I, I misspoke. Okay. What I meant to say really is, I do care, but I, what I don't care about is the phrase, "Can you just get them out of here quickly?" That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying mm. I don't care what they think. Or what they, you know, want to contribute to the plan of care. But it really, I guess it's more of a bother to me when someone says, just do this quickly, because I think that's really inappropriate. And I don't care if the patient has been there a hundred times that day. I'll be the judge of that. Okay. Like this is, I'm not trying to be pretentious or rude, but I, I just don't think that it's a, it's a good call to say, just get this patient out of here quickly. It's a complete complete opposite of what we're talking about with malingering, but it is something to consider. You don't want to miss something just because someone else has said, uh, blah, blah, blah's back, you know, that's all. Yeah, no, I, I think it's valid. Uh, we, we call that cueing, right? Whether it's EMS, sure. nurses, uh, a previous chart, right? And you can have this premature closure where your mind is closed to further suggestions. And I've, you know, very recently had to, be an advocate for a patient who, who, you know, I was suggested, hey, just give them a sandwich to get them out of here. And it's like, did you see what they were doing half a minute ago? Like, this yeah. is not a sandwich and go patient. Right, right. Well, you know, if you do want to obtain more tests or imaging, uh, you know, then don't be afraid to do that. Like, kind of like queuing off of what you just said, so to speak, right? It's like, maybe you pick out something that wasn't evident at some point. And so don't close your thoughts off to the fact that there could be some sort of organic cause going on here, right? That's the number one rule of uh, diagnosing somebody with a psychiatric feature or condition. You have to make sure that there is no organic etiology. So maybe you get you a CBC, maybe you get you an electrolyte panel, uh, liver function, Maybe some sort of a, a tox panel in terms of alcohol, UDS, salicylates, acetaminophen. Maybe you get an ammonia. Maybe they're acting weird because they're having encephalopathy. Maybe you go CT MRI of the brain potentially, especially if there are these kind of new hallucinations, new weird headaches, new bizarre behavior that wasn't evidence in the past. Right. You know, something that my dad, Jim Roberts, taught me a long time ago was that... <laughs> You know, there are clinicians that say, don't order that because we'll get more information and have to do something about it, right? Like, it's just like obtaining an alcohol level <laughs> on a patient. No, there are people that are like, don't get an alcohol on the patient because then I got to keep them around. Like, you know, you blankety blank can go with that. Honestly, like, I, I'm not going to not do an alcohol level on a patient that looks drunk to me. Like, I want to know, are you really drunk or is there something else going on? So what do I care if the patient has to be there eight hours or 10 hours? hours. I want to do the right thing for the patient. That's what's important to me. And there are absolutely, Mike, you know, there's clinicians that are like, oh man, I don't want to order a kidney function on this patient. I know they're going to have renal failure. I know it. But do you got to do it? Why would you not? Anyway, that's, that's why you order it, right? I that's know. why you order it is to, to find the abnormal uh, arrhythmia or, you know, whatever, right? 
Right. But you know, you know these tests aren't getting done on some patients because people, quote, don't want to deal with it. Well, tough shaboogies, all right? This is your job. So let's go actually into treating and managing these patients. And I think I'm going to give you this actual patient we talked about named Sam, um, who's not really named Sam, but uh, we have... Uh, some ways we can handle these situations. First of all, don't confront the patient directly in regards to feigning his or her illness. Like just that's 101, don't be a jerk. This can create a lot of conflict or even a lawsuit against you can ensue or even violence from the patient. So get off your high horse there, okay? Rather, the best thing to do is confront the patient indirectly about some of the resources. So like that they've tried to approach to treat their problem. Like be like, well, what have you done? And tell me about how you're feeling and how it's changed. And based on evidence, useful interviewing techniques like behavioral therapy, cognitive therapy, psychotherapy, counseling, it's all known to help patients feel safe and discuss with you their problems and talk it out while acknowledging their complaint. You find out a lot, right? So during your differential diagnosis and treatment plan, this is where you can go into writing some rather lengthy paragraphs. Okay. First, you should be discussing the organic causes of the disease, if it's present or not, and why you may have considered them or ruled them out. Organic disorders, any physical illness or diagnosis other than malingering, of course, should be ruled out before considering this diagnosis of malingering. Right. Other things that are like this are things like conversion disorders or somatoform disorders. These are conditions in which either patients are very scared of having something or maybe they have a symptom that they perceive, but they're kind of blowing it out of proportion. It's already been worked up and, and there's nothing there, but they're, they're still concerned and so they keep on coming for care. Those are slightly different than everything else we're talking about today. Identify stressors, identify social determinants of health, identify what could be some incentives for the patient to be diagnosed or further worked up for the thing that they're looking for. Consider, like we mentioned, the factitious disorders, whether it's uh, on them or on uh, another. And, uh, you know, there's also, uh, you know, other things like psychosis, schizophrenia, depression, mania, drug abuse, overdose, accidental poisoning. I mean, like sometimes people really do have something slipped into their oatmeal or whatever else, yeah. right? So uh, I get that patient once in a while. I, yeah. I had someone the other day that was like, my father's trying to kill me. And I'm like, what? You know, maybe the patient is uh, crazy, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're not crazy and they really need your help. Yeah. So quite frankly, there's an excellent smart phrase I do say so myself that I put together with the help of some lawyers <laughs> for the malingering patient. And that identifies a lot of the things that remind me of actual medical diagnoses that I actually could have missed or maybe I should have considered. And I want to act in the best interest of the patient. I certainly want to appease their needs. I do. And many times these patients simply, they just want a work note. I have no problems giving that. One of the best things to do here is say, ah, okay, we're getting ready your discharge. I'm putting a work note together for you. Would you like to go uh, back to work on Monday or do you need a few more days? And then when they get to make that decision, it helps them process what's going on. And if they ask for a week, it's no problem. When they ask for two months, uh, I kind of wonder about that. And certainly asking more questions about the stressors, it will help you um, achieve, achieve a good plan. I, I have my fair share of patients that I've really come to know for better or for worse over the past uh, couple you know, years at my hospital. But I want to hear about your case about Sam. Yeah, so Sam. This is a patient that frequently visits the emergency department every single day, sometimes twice a day for complaints of things like abdominal pain, chest pain, headache, occasionally just once the dose of the nighttime medication, sometimes uh, just signs in, says wants food, other times signs in and says he's not sure why he's there. I recently did a deep dive on his chart, okay? I, I did a real deep dive like five, six, seven years ago, and I'm always friendly to him. I um, certainly express genuine concern upon every visit, and the first thing I do is ask him, what can I help you with today, Sam? Occasionally, he says, I, I just need a meal, and then I say, well, I'm going to tell you where the food services are and how you can get to that, and our social worker will be out to speak to you. He usually acknowledges that, and he's discharged after I physically examine him. Speaking of physical exam, Mike, the second thing I do after talking to him briefly is I do a full head-to-toe exam, exposing the arms, the legs, palpating the belly, everything I would do for any patient. I listen to the heart. I listen to the lungs. 
I don't care whether he was here five minutes ago or five hours ago or five days ago. Every patient deserves a physical exam. And, you know, Mike, just a side note, I find it very interesting that the last two visits I personally have had to the ED, not a single physician, nurse practitioner, or nurse put a stethoscope on my chest and listened to my lungs or my heart. I find it quite amazing how little people physically touch and examine patients these days. It's appalling. And I think we should do a future podcast on that. We've kind of talked about it in the past, but I won't digress too much. Just do your physical exam, okay? After I do my physical exam, I comment on anything that is abnormal, unusual, certainly things that we talked about on this segment, and offer additional clothing or shoes, always socks, and food or pain medication if that's something that's needed. I provide reassurance, and then I assure the patient, you know, there's no there's no danger to themselves. Um, you know, uh, there's no danger to anybody else here. I'm assuring the patient that they're okay, and I've kind of checked all the boxes there. Finally, in my documentation, this is something that I write and I feel comfortable standing behind uh, for any patient who has been malingering in our department. And I want to do something. I want to see how long it takes me to dictate this. Okay, so I'm going to start the timer and how long it would take you to use dictation to write what you were really thinking and feeling about any patient, whether it be malingering, whether it be chest pain, I don't care, anything at all. Let's see how long it takes me to dictate this into the chart. All right, I'm ready. Sam is a 35-year-old male who has a history of bipolar disorder and violent behavior. He's here today for the second time for complaints of, quote, needing an evaluation. The patient was seen here several hours ago by my colleague, and I have reviewed the chart and those complaints. During the visit earlier today, the patient received a CBC and electrolyte panel that were all within normal limits. I reviewed these. His EKG was within normal limits, and I reviewed this again with an attending physician. Let's put in the patient's, uh, excuse me, the physician's name I reviewed it with. He received a chest X-ray earlier because he reported he had a mild cough that was also reviewed by me, both the imaging and radiology report. The clinician who saw the patient earlier was still here, so I was able to s- discuss with them the case. The patient frequents the emergency department, sometimes several emergency departments every day in the city. Today, he was also earlier at Sutter, which was his third visit to an emergency department. I'm very familiar with this patient both on physical and personal level as I have become quite involved in his care over the years. And today he looks like he's at his baseline. He is disheveled, but the patient is homeless and is comfortable with his housing plan. He has been offered multiple different housing plans by social work and recently was given a cell phone to help make follow-up appointments. The patient does not follow up with appointments despite our incessant calling and scheduling. The patient was given free resources again on campus for walk-in clinic and our social work clinic. The patient was provided food and clothing and offered water. My exam did not show anything acute today. I did notice a small scratch on his right forearm that he said he had done from reaching for a bus pass in his jeans. He had no other signs of physical abuse or trauma. His mental status is acceptable for his baseline and he is rational. His GCS is 15. He is not suicidal or homicidal. He was given Tylenol earlier today and states he doesn't need anything for pain. I feel it is appropriate to discharge this patient and I have considered other diagnoses today. His diagnosis is malingering and his full workup is normal and appropriate for him to follow up as an outpatient. That was one minute and 49 seconds, so under two minutes to talk about my whole plan, what I think the patient needs or doesn't need, and if you even want to add in this phrase, which I love to do for any patient, not just malingering, the patient thanked me and was encouraged to follow up with any new worsening problems or return promptly to the ED. Yeah, we all know how this would go, really, though. Sam is a 35-year-old male who has a history of bipolar dis- bipolar, bi- bi- dis- disorder. So that's how that's how my dictation usually goes. <laughs> I'm repeating the same thing over and over. It's like, no, I didn't say, like, um, buspirone. I said bipolar. Like, yeah, anyways, I'm just kidding. I-, I love my dictation, Mike. I would really be suffering without it here. That's That's a lot. But it's I not also, a lot. It took me two minutes, Mike. Okay. I was going to say that it's a lot, and it's a lot of the stuff that I do as well. I document a lot of these things. Uh, so some of the things I want to kind of highlight and pull out, I I pull out some of these history of, of past behavioral illness, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, antisocial. I totally front load that in the statement like you have. So I fully agree with that one there. Not that you're asking about my concurrence, but I do do that as well. I said do-do. Do-do. I talk about 
most recent visits. I'll even talk about like three in one day, you know, eight in the past 74, 72 hours, whatever. So I'll talk about that. I'll talk about multiple emergency departments. I don't necessarily go into every single study, but I will say like, you know, he received, you know, a, a thorough workup at these visits and I reviewed those results. I, I think it's really important to, like you said, point out disheveled, point out odd behavior. I'm really worried about people who are going too fast, maybe using kind of the dot phrases or dictation, copying, pasting, which we'll talk about in a second. You have this patient who is, you know, the, the presentation is quite bizarre. And then someone dictates mood and affect, normal behavior, normal. And it's like, wait a minute, you just spent a, a paragraph telling me this person is, to lack of a better phrase, weird and then you just said that their you know cognition and mood and affect are normal that doesn't match up and i think that that is like lawyer food no right that's there. baseline for the patient the patient no, no, no. people are weird that doesn't no. make them sick no i agree no i what i'm saying is they can be weird and at baseline but their baseline is not normal right it's this normal for is, them it's normal for them but it's not normal in the broad range of human mood and affect. It doesn't right? matter. You don't, it just because you're weird, it doesn't mean you're sick and people are weird all the time and we minimize how different people are. You know, I think that it's, I don't copy and paste all these smart phrases for patients necessarily every time I see them. What is, what is more important here, you mentioned uh, reviewing the imaging. I have been close to diagnosing someone with malingering and then brought up their chest x-ray and I'm like, oh, maybe they do have an ammonia. Let me look at this again. Hey, radiologist, can you relook at this x-ray that was done three hours ago? Oh yeah, that guy looks like he has a pneumonia. Then it's a whole different story, right? So why you don't want to be caught not reviewing that stuff, especially if later someone's like, look, this guy had a chest x-ray earlier. Why didn't you look at it? Of course I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at it because I want to look at it, not because I care about what a lawyer says, but because I want to look at it. So I, I just... I don't know. People can be weird, Mike. Uh, you're weird. <laughs> I I endorse that, and I stand behind it. What I'm trying to say is that if you fully call somebody normal with their behavior without commenting on their baseline or whatever, if you just at face value say this is a normal mood and affect and behavior pattern for this person – after you spent a paragraph saying this is an abnormal patient who comes in to the ED, I didn't a dozen say he was times. abnormal. I know, but but you you just spent a, a paragraph saying he went he frequents the emergency department, several departments every day in the city. Today this is, is the exact third visit to the yeah, but, ED. But Mike, this is the exact diagnosis of malingering. Go back to points one through five from earlier and what NIH said. These are the exact same things that, that the DSM five doesn't want to particularly label as weird or malingering. But that is what I am saying in this paragraph. Like, yes, I mean, this is an antisocial type of behavior or maybe um this uh, feigning an illness type of thing. I stand by what I said. And you know what? I'm sure there's a good way to write it for any patient, but I just don't want our listeners to be afraid of saying these things and feeling confident that there's nothing wrong with that patient today. It's okay. It's okay. The thing I'm disagreeing with is not anything you wrote out or described. The thing I'm disagreeing with is somebody calling a patient who is obviously abnormal, normal mood and affect. And I think at this point, we're kind of talking past each other. And so I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Dictation, if it goes perfectly smoothly, it doesn't take that much to get in. A minute 40, if uh, it reads you properly, uh, especially with certain people, like uh, you know, I think that there are certain things that you can have smart phrases on because, as you say, you do a physical exam on everybody, and I'll hazard to say that your physical exam hits some of the same points on a regular basis. You don't radically vary your physical exam patient to patient if you're doing a kind of headed to a physical. So, you know, I personally think that it's all right to use – if it's your standard practice – to examine either behavior or physical aspect of their body the same way every time, I think it's okay to use some sort of a uh, efficiency phrase there because 
It speaks to your efficiency and your care for the patient to do the same exam for everybody. You can only describe an abdominal exam so many different ways. And so I think that there is some value to using some efficiency <laughs> phrases here. What are your thoughts about those things? I mean, efficiency phrases are fine, just as long as you actually did the work. It's fine. Most definitely. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously we, have, we vary a little bit here. We have some differences of opinion, but I think that we agree. I'm being serious. I think we agree that the approach to the patient is the same. Mm -hmm. You don't get cued. You give the patient a fair shake because like even patients who are, again, for lack of a better word, weird, they still get sick. And maybe they get sick with odder things and other folks get that don't live on the margins. And so you almost have to be especially on point with these patients. And so whatever you choose to put down as their final diagnosis, uh, I think that the plan, Martha, you, you put down is exactly what I do in the ED. Okay. And, uh, you know, you do a good physical exam, you do a chart biopsy and really understand what's up with these patients if you're not particularly familiar with this patient, even though they may have been seen in the ED multiple times by multiple people, if you don't know that person or they're telling you weird stuff that it's like, that's odd. Charles usually says X, Y, Z, but today he's saying A, B, C. This is totally outside of Charles's pattern. That can be a clue like, wait a minute, is he actually sick today? What's going on there? So yeah. let, you know, I, you, you you have to, after a while, if like your hand, if you're hand waving away too many things, if you hand wave away a second thing that is unusual for your patient who's in there all the time, that should be your cue of like, I just tried to explain away a second thing. I need to take a second and kind of come back. Yeah. So remember that any patient that tells you that they have something going on, yeah, believe them, investigate. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to order tests or medications, but always consider the possibility that a patient's condition can change at any moment in time. And, you know, I'm not diagnosing people with malingering every day, Mike. I'm just giving everybody sort of both sides of how you can approach this. And at the end of the day, you're the one that discharged the patient, not the nurse, not the doctor. You're the one that saw them, evaluated them. So put your best foot forward. Make sure that you're putting the patient first and worrying about all the other stuff, whether it's charting or medications or diagnosis, like just focus on the patient that's in front of you. And really, truly, if you do that, you can do no wrong. Really focus on the patient. So anyway, my, Mike. My, my personal rule quick, just because I've, I spent a lot of time talking what I don't do, what I, I'm going to say it again, what I do do in these patients is I'll just take whatever they say at face value in a sense. I'll say I diagnose them with abdominal pain or headache or chest pain because like I can't say they're not having a headache or abdominal pain or chest pain so I say yeah that's your diagnosis but I chart almost the same exact thing that you describe and and I feel like when I do that I'm saying it without saying it right like someone can look at your chart and go this guy's here how many times that's weird. And, and so right away, the person who's reading this goes, oh, I, I can see what Martha is trying to say here, what Mike is trying to say. And so I, I like saying it without saying it. That's my personal take. But I understand your take too, and I'm, I'm not totally opposed to it. I think that there are kind of some guidelines here where the, the diagnosis is, is appropriate. And by the way, someone can have bipolar disorder and other mental illnesses and be uh, appropriate uh, coherent and GCS 15 and, and, uh, what, what, what else did I say? He was, um, uh, normal cognition. Yeah. I mean, they can still have prior diagnosis of bipolar and they're not there behaving bizarrely. I know I didn't say that, but, um, anyway, <laughs> it's an hour now and I want to take us to the end. I'm going to save our something sweets for next week. Okay. Because I, I really would like to get to the trivia question because did you have a winner? Because I did not. Mm, 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 mm. Well, um, if you didn't, we can also save that for next week because we have some big giveaways coming about. 
Well, I was going to say I, that's, I was pausing for Dave to kind of cut the feed for a second because, like, I wanted to go back and make sure because I was I just realized like, oh, I don't think I did that part here. So, well, you know what? Um, you don't don't even. It's okay, Dave. Um, I'll tell you what. For our listeners, we're going to give you potentially two winners next week, so don't you fret. And we're going to hold off on a repeat question because we have our 40th episode and a really big giveaway. So let's hold off on doing any additional, uh, you know, freebies for now and. And uh, you can take us out. What do you think? You could uh, dos- you could disagree with me on that too. You know. Let's roll. Let's uh, we'll do two trivia questions. Two two view trivia questions for a fourth episode. I okay. love it. I yeah. love it. Okay. okay. Well, you can still email us anything you want to email us. What you do for patients with anything from hypervirulent Klebsiella pneumoniae to malingering and everything between. Shoot us your thoughts at our email address. That is twoviewcast at gmail.com. That's the number twoviewcast at gmail.com. More information on the original and advanced emergency medicine boot camps, the Mastering Pediatric Emergency Medicine course, the Emergency Medicine and Acute Care course. We just announced some dates on that for 2025. Start booking your vacay early or any of our courses are available at the Center for Medical Education website. That is www.ccme.org, www.ccme.org. We're always adding new stuff on there, believe it or not, Mike. We are working on an urgent care course as well as an NCLEX review course. So keep checking back for more, and we look forward to 2025. Uh, I'm just going to point out that I've been working on urgent, uh, urgent, urgent care for 14 years. So if you're doing an urgent care course, uh, hook a brother up, please. I'll think thank about you. it. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for listening and attending this episode of The Two View. You can subscribe and rate us on Apple iTunes Podcasts, uh, RIP Google Podcasts, it's not YouTube Music, and Spotify. Search for Two View Emergency. That's the number Two View Emergency. It'll come right up. Ratings help us climb the charts so that other clinicians get some good Two View goodness like you have today. If you like the YouTube and you want to see the video version instead, search for Center for Medical Education, and you can catch the video version, or you can go to ccmelive.org, and that'll take you right to the appropriate YouTube page. Don't forget our website, where you can go next level on any of our topics from any of our episodes. You can get the CME on malingering that Martha was referring you to, uh, all the papers and sites. That's twoview.fireside.fm. Our audio and video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave. Dave Pet show notes are by Meg Dipple. Thank you again for turning in, friends. Turning in, turning into what a pumpkin, which is what I'm going to do now. <laughs> Thank you again for tuning in, friends and EM. Share this podcast with a friend. Share your thoughts via email, and thanks for sharing your time with us on the Two View. Have a good day and a great shift. Can I get another turkey sandwich, please, before I go? Goodbye, Mike.